Hello everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeters and I'm honored to serve as Associate Minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you are carrying with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. I welcome you to our worship service today by inviting you to repeat our mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let's return to our beloved sanctuary for the lighting of the flaming chalice symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Good morning. My name is Kevin Gibson and I'm very happy to be your worship associate this morning. Now, I don't remember many of my dreams, but a few do stand out. One was in my early 20s, when I'm being watching too many horror films or reading too much philosophy, or mixing the two quite badly. In my dream, I was standing in a pentagram, a five-sided star. I was safe in the pentagram, I knew. A voice was telling me that if I had faith, I could simply step outside it with impunity. But I was keenly aware that if I didn't have faith, that my soul would be scattered like a thousand broken glass shards and cast into the dark void. And in my dream, I realised that I was questioning whether I had sufficient faith. And the very fact that I'd allowed even the possibility of doubt meant that I wasn't completely convinced. I couldn't will myself to believe, and if I had any suspicion that I wouldn't be safe in taking that step, the voice would know. In short, I was stuck in my small pentagram. It reminds me of a story that I heard at church as a child. It describes a man who's walking along a cliff and suddenly loses his balance and falls off. As he's tumbling down, he's able to grab and hold on to a small branch. He is barely hanging on with a deep drop below. He doesn't know what to do, so he yells out, Is there anybody up there who can help me? There is no answer. He calls again, is there anybody up there who can help me? No answer again. He keeps calling. Finally, a rich voice calls back. This is God. I can help you. Just let go and flights of angels will catch you and take you back to the rim. The man pauses and then shouts, is there anybody else up there who can help me? Both my dream and the story pitch faith and knowledge. Knowledge can be verified, but faith requires trust and an absence of doubt. But I'm a natural skeptic. As the phrase goes, trust but verify. And in fact, that is what science actually does. It poses hypotheses but they're always contingent on a better one coming along. Indeed, the hallmarks of science are that phenomena can be replicated, and there are critical predictions where, if they fail, the theory has to be scrapped. If I go back to the dream and the story, I now see that there's something wrong with the presumptions. Knowledge and faith don't have to be binary, just one or the other. It isn't a case of right or wrong, true or untrue, real or unreal. It's just that we have to do the best with what we do know to make sense of the world around us. In my pentagram, 
it didn't have to be that I was either in or out, simple states which would decide my fate. Similarly, hanging on from the branch, the guy didn't have to trust or not trust, which I was told, but maybe his answer showed that there are always other options. And this is why I like being a UU. I'm on a faith journey. It isn't settled. I'm open to insights or wisdom that may add or even detract from my best beliefs. It isn't an easy or comfortable tradition, as I can't rely on dogma, but it fits me because I tend to question things that I'm told by authority figures unless I've actually assessed them for myself. Finally, the image I'd like to leave you with is the less dramatic picture of me on a bicycle. I don't know how they stay upright, but I'm told that it's a constant balancing act that only works if you maintain momentum. The UU adventure is like that. It isn't a binary choice between blind faith or total skepticism, but balances the known and the unknown in our search for truth and meaning.
I'm going to brag on myself for a moment and then not brag. When I was in my last year of study at seminary, I was selected by the dean to pursue a special academic project of my choice. This was a big honor. I declined. All I could think of to do was follow my favorite liturgical theologian dancer across the country to find out how she did what she did. Not a very academically worthy project. On the positive side, my decision showed that I had enjoyed ample opportunity in my regular coursework to learn and pursue knowledge. When I received the invitation from the dean, I was satiated with intellectual knowing. I was almost ready to graduate, eager to apply my knowledge to begin real ministry with a real congregation. On the negative side, I turned down an opportunity that would have looked good on my resume. What type of knowing did I use to make that decision? I cleaved to my body knowledge. At that point, I was done with sitting and reading treatises by scholars who could really use a good editor. My body wisdom told me that it was time to use what I had learned. I chose practical knowing over intellectual knowing. Daniel Goleman tells a story in his 1995 groundbreaking book, Emotional Intelligence, that to the casual observer, four-year-old Judy might seem a wallflower among her more gregarious playmates. She hangs back from the action at playtime, staying on the margins of games rather than plunging into the center. But Judy is actually a keen observer of the social politics of her preschool classroom. Her sophistication is not apparent until Judy's teacher gathers the four-year-olds around to play what they call the classroom game. The classroom game is a dollhouse replica of the student's own preschool classroom with stick figures who have for head small photos of their students and teachers. When Judy's teacher asks her to put each stick figure of each child in the part of the room they like to play in most, the art corner, the blocks corner, and so on, Judy does so with complete accuracy. And when asked to put each figure with the children they like to play with most, Judy shows she can match best friends for the entire class. Judy's accuracy reveals that she has a perfect social map of her class, a level of perceptiveness exceptional for a four-year-old. I don't think I had that level of social perceptiveness at Judy's age. Did you? And I'm certain that type of social knowing has declined for me after two years of pandemic separation from community. Psychologist Howard Gardner said decades ago, we should spend less time ranking children and more time helping them to identify their natural competencies and gifts and cultivate those. He said there are hundreds and hundreds of ways to succeed and many, many different abilities that will help you get there. He points out that the glory days of the IQ tests began during World War I when two million American men were sorted out through the first mass paper and pencil form of the IQ test, freshly developed by Lewis Terman, a psychologist at Stanford. This led to decades of what Gardner calls the IQ way of knowing, that people are either smart or not. They are born that way, that there's nothing much you can do about it, and that tests can tell you if you are one of the smart ones or not. The SAT test for college admissions is based on the same notion of a single kind of aptitude that determines your future. This way of thinking permeates society. Gardner's work, and you may be familiar with it, 
proposes multiple intelligences instead, including verbal, mathematical, logical, spatial, kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, and intra-psychic. Gardner and his colleagues eventually stretched these seven into 20 different varieties of intelligence. I believe that multiple intelligences result in different types of knowing, and we could benefit if we know which ones we have and which ones we need. Different cultures and different religions may prioritize some types of knowing over others. Our own Unitarian ancestors did this. According to historian David Robinson, Unitarianism emerged in New England in opposition to the emotional fervor of the Great Awakening in the 1740s, in reaction to the outpouring of emotion in the Christian revival meetings. Charles Chauncey articulated an alternative, positive set of ideas, which paved the way for Unitarianism. His ideas fall loosely into three categories, Robinson wrote. A commitment to logic and reason in theology. A biblicism that demanded critical and historical analysis. And an overriding concern for moral aspiration as the focal point of the Christian religion. In 1742, Chauncey wrote a sermon called Enthusiasm Described and Cautioned Against, which criticized the misleading emotions of the revival movement. Robinson wrote, Chauncey began with a careful distinction between the enthusiasm that signifies inspiration from God, usually associated with the prophets and the apostles, and the more modern sense of it. Chauncey preached, the label enthusiast describes one who mistakes the workings of his own passions for divine communications and fancies himself immediately inspired by the Spirit of God when all the while he is under no other influence than that of an overheated imagination. Robinson claims Chauncey pointed to the Bible as the authoritative key to discerning enthusiasm. It is also clear from his discussion that the usefulness of the Bible is dependent on the rational interpretation of it. Joseph Stevens Buckminster took up the mantle of rationalism in Christianity in the next generation of liberal New England ministers. Robinson wrote, Buckminster was an early leader in bringing the German higher criticism of the Bible to America. He was called to Brattle Street Church in Boston in 1804, where he preached a distinctly liberal message of rational religion and character development. Sound familiar? <laughs> he was a proponent of rational investigation into the Bible, a stand that insisted that the scriptures be read in their historical context and be subjected to the same scrupulous scholarly investigation given to other texts from antiquity. Sadly, Buckminster died at the age of 28, but his contemporaries carried and strengthened his legacy. William Ellery Channing was most notable among them. In 1819, Channing took the opportunity to travel from Boston to Baltimore to preach at an ordination ceremony. The sermon itself was an hour and a half long and titled Unitarian Christianity, although it quickly became known as the Baltimore Sermon because of its pivotal and far-reaching impact. Printed copies of the sermon pamphlet were published soon after the ceremony, and it is said that demand was so great that only Tom Paine's common sense pamphlet had ever before circulated so widely in this country. In his sermon, Channing claimed the name Unitarian, 
which had previously been used only as a pejorative. He articulated the impending separation of the liberals from the orthodox and explained the theology and priorities of this liberal wing of the New England Congregationalists. Historian Conrad Wright wrote, Channing believed that human reason can and must be used to establish certain basic truths of religion, such as the existence of God. But these doctrines must be supplemented by a special revelation which is to be found in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Channing was sensitive to the charge that the liberals exalted reason above revelation, and the Baltimore Sermon made a special point of refuting that charge. For him, as for earlier anti-Trinitarians, the conclusive argument for rejection of the doctrine of the Trinity was that it is unscriptural. The theme of the Baltimore Sermon is that the scriptures correctly interpreted teach the doctrines of liberal Christians or Unitarians using methods of biblical criticism then regarded as novel, if not revolutionary. In the 18th century, Wright concludes, the liberals were wont to complain that the Orthodox, especially the evangelical revivalists, were constructing Christian doctrine on the basis of isolated verses of the Bible wrenched entirely out of context. Any kind of absurdity, they complain, can be demonstrated on the basis of isolated proof texts. The Baltimore Sermon emphasizes that the Bible is a book written for people, in the language of people, and cannot be understood without a knowledge of the original tongues in which it was composed, the culture of the Jewish people, and the special historical circumstances that occasioned particular books, and even the quirks of personality of some of the authors. Channing was Ralph Waldo Emerson's minister at Federal Street Church in Boston. And initially, they shared the same approach and beliefs. Historian Conrad Wright wrote, in 1831, Emerson had no other basis for religious truth than rational argument founded on the experience of the senses, together with special revelation attested by miracles. By 1834, Emerson had broken away from the old patterns of thought of the previous generation and had moved into a new intellectual climate in which the familiar arguments for miracles could be casually dismissed as irrelevant. In May of that year, in a letter to his brother, Emerson wrote, Reason is the highest faculty of the soul. It is the power by which we apprehend truth immediately without calculation or proof. The understanding, on the other hand, toils all the time, dwelling in the expedient, the customary. On the level of the understanding, we have varying degrees of intellectual capacity. But reason is potentially perfect in every person. Our everyday life may be lived on the level of the understanding but our deepest insights into timeless truths, our intuitions of the reason, and religion and poetry belong in its domain. Emerson was the most well-known spokesperson for the transcendentalist claim that humans can have direct intuitions of truth, direct experiences of the divine in nature without need of intermediaries. This obviously put the authority of Jesus, the apostles, and any minister in a different position. Emerson said in his famous Divinity School address delivered before the senior class at Harvard Divinity School in 1838, whilst the doors of the temple stand open night and day before every person, and the oracles of this truth cease never, it is guarded by one stern condition, this namely, 
it is an intuition. It cannot be received at second hand. Truly speaking, it is not instruction, but provocation that I can receive from another soul. What they announce, I must find true in me, or wholly reject. And on their word, I can accept nothing. The transcendentalists prioritized intuitive knowing and experiential knowing. I'm telling you all this so that you have some intellectual knowing of our history and so you can hear it echo in today's religious controversies, whether they be conflicts about abortion, guns, or the preservation of democracy. It may help fortify your emotional intelligence, your experiential knowing, and ground your actions in the polarized society in which we live. It can help to know our intellectual roots and to claim the essential interaction of doubt and faith as our beliefs evolve. Buddhist teacher Sharon Salzberg wrote in her book, Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. In order to deepen our faith, we have to be able to try things out, to wonder, to doubt, in fact, faith is strengthened by doubt when doubt is a sincere, critical questioning combined with deep trust in our own right to discern the truth. In Buddhism, this kind of questioning is known as skillful doubt. For doubt to be skillful, we have to be close enough to an issue to care about it, yet open enough to let questioning come alive. Unlike skillful doubt, which brings us closer to exploring the truth, unskillful doubt pulls us farther away. A story from the Buddha's life illustrates the consequences of unskillful doubt. After his enlightenment, the Buddha arose from his place under the Bodhi tree and set out walking along the road. The first person he encountered was struck by the radiance of his face and the power of his presence. Dazzled, the man asked, Who are you? The Buddha replied, I am an awakened one. The man just said, Well, maybe, and walked away. Had he shown curiosity, then taken the time to follow up on his doubt by asking questions, he might have discovered something profoundly transforming. Salzburg continues, This kind of walk-away doubt manifests as cynicism. Cynicism is actually a self-protective mechanism. A cynical stance allows us to feel smart and unthreatened without really being involved. The cynic not only doubts, however, but also refuses to investigate the object of that doubt. Rather than engaging a person or a problem, the cynic says, what does that have to do with me? Like the man who met the Buddha and walked away, the cynic says, prove it, without bothering to stick around to question, to see just what proof might be forthcoming. So where are we now as Unitarian Universalists? Do we value one type of knowing over another? Do we trust each other's intuition or do we let cynicism block it? Do you think less of me because as I was about to finish seminary in 1996, I chose practical knowing over intellectual knowing? What does our UU worship style reveal about our preferences for different types of knowing? Are we uncomfortable when our bodies know to move to the music? Do we allow our tears to flow when emotions arise? What role does art have in our knowing? 
Art therapist Pat B. Allen wrote in her book, Art is a Way of Knowing, images take me apart, images put me back together, new, enlarged, with breathing room. For decades I have kept a record of my inner life in images, paintings, drawings, and words. Art making is my way of bringing soul back into my life. Soul is the place where the messiness of life is tolerated, where feelings animate the narration of life, where story exists. Soul is the place where I am replenished and can experience both gardens and graveyards. Art is my way of knowing who I am. Liesl Mueller wrote in her poem, Monet Refuses the Operation. Doctor, you say there are no halos around the streetlights in Paris, and what I see is an aberration caused by old age and affliction. I tell you, it has taken me all my life to arrive at the vision of gas lamps as angels to soften and blur and finally banish the edges you regret I don't see, to learn that the line I called the horizon does not exist, and sky and water so long apart are the same state of being. Fifty-four years before I could see Rouen Cathedral is built of parallel shafts of sun, and now you want to restore my youthful errors, fixed notions of top and bottom, the illusion of three-dimensional space, wisteria separate from the bridge it covers. I will not return to a universe of objects that don't know each other, as if islands were not the lost children of one great continent. Doctor, if only you could see how heaven pulls earth into its arms and how infinitely the heart expands to claim this world, blue vapor without end. This poem reminds me that different human beings have different types of knowing. We can rely on and learn from each other's different knowings to strengthen community. Let us offer our types of knowing to each other to help navigate the increasingly challenging reality in which we live. May it be so. Dear ones, I'll leave you with these closing words by Arthur Foote. May peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our wills and love of truth forever guide us. May it be so. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah.